give me one shot here on a blue chip stock, believe me, Kevin, the only problem I'm gonna have is that you didn't buy more. Nobody knows if the stock is gonna go up, down, sideways, or in circles. What's going on, NBA draft fans? Your boys are back. The Wolves of Ball Street, your favorite draft analysts, favorite draft analysts. It's the NBA Draft Show on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed. My name's Corey Telba. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Albert Garbage Time. Gim, Albert, what's going on, man? <laughs> it's been a minute. Um, yes. It has been a little bit. Uh, I don't even know what I'm saying. I'm sorry. I, I, That's how long it's been. <laughs> I got caught in between two things. Um, but it's great to be back. Uh, excited to talk hoops. I've been... It's been fun, dude. The season is weird because Corey, like we always talk about every year you come into a draft class and people have a million different opinions whether a draft class is strong or weak or whatever and i think i've had some really interesting conversations with people and we're gonna have a really fun one today um but i I think this class is more interesting than people realize um and there are some guys that i think are going to play in the nba which is a really basic comment but better than what people thought it was going to be at the start of the year. So um, I'm excited to talk about the guys we're talking about today. Yeah, I, I think that the, I mean, if you're into the draft space, if you're into scouting, like it doesn't get any better than this. You know, if you're a casual NBA fan whose team is tanking, you know, if you've lost a thousand straight games like the Detroit Pistons and you don't necessarily see like the bright light at the end of the tunnel because there's not like a can't miss prospect Mm-hmm. Maybe not as fun, but right. for us as sickos, we're psyched about this, right? Like this is the most fun that we could possibly have because we can really get in the weeds and like opinions are going to vary on so many prospects. And some people are going to think that our latest mock draft makes us look like lunatics, like a commenter on Reddit mm-hmm. um, had to let the world know before the world of Reddit had no ceilings back and was like, This is totally reasonable. I think you're overreacting, to put it kindly, Um, because it's like this is just one of those drafts and where we're at in the cycle. Like it's not even 2024 yet. So like we only have so many games to go on. We're not in conference play like you have. It's small sample size, high variance stuff like, you know, let's have some fun. I'm right there with you, man. Uh, These things take time, as uh, Tyler Rucker likes to say, and uh, we're just at the beginning. And the funny thing is, whatever our boards look like right now, whatever our mock drafts look like right now, we're going, as you said, based off of what we've seen so far and what we know right now, over the course of the next three, four months, a lot is going to change. The next six months, a lot is going to change. So um, we're not claiming to know everything. And that's where I think sometimes people can make mistakes on the internet when they claim to know everything at the Mm -hmm. start of a draft class. I think we're not making that claim at all. Um, I think we're kind of with everybody else and we're in the weeds and we're trying to explore and we're trying to learn and we're trying to give you guys the best content and analysis as possible, but we are not claiming to know everything and we're excited to dig into these players just like everyone else. Yes, we are. And we have two really fun uh, prospects that we're going to cover today. The first of which um, is Otega Owe the six foot five wing from Oklahoma. And, um, you know, Otega is a guy who is not even yet like on a ton of big boards. Um, no ceilings had him at 44 on the latest big board that we dropped over on the, on the site. And Sam Vecini at the athletic has him at 86. Other than that, I believe he's unranked, um, just about everywhere. So, you know, I, I personally don't think that, that's going to hold. I think that he's somebody that is going to find his way onto more boards as the season goes on. But at the same time, you know, like, like we said, there's only so many games and this could just be people being patient and trying to hold on a little longer to the stock of some of the, you know, maybe the freshmen and, and that had hype built up and not wanting to give up on that. And I think that's totally reasonable too, but let's talk a little bit of the background of Otega Owe. Um, so six foot five, 215 pounds. He is averaging 14.9 points, four rebounds, 1.1 assists 
on shooting splits of 66.7% from the field, 75% from three, 74.1% from the free throw line. He has an effective field goal percentage of 71.7, a PER of 27.7. He has a steal rate of 5.3, a block rate of 2.1, a BPM of 11.8. He has been very impactful for a very, very good Oklahoma team um, that has, you know, a, a good amount of fun prospects. So um, what has been, you know, your impression on Otega uh, thus far coming into the year? Um, you know, it's funny, Corey, I was actually having a conversation with um, Evan uh, from our site, No Ceilings, and also uh, Maxwell. We were talking a little <laughs> bit about Otega because he is an interesting guy. And once again, Corey, like you mentioned earlier, we have to look at things through the lens, through the prism, through whatever the angle um, <laughs> of the fact that this is a perceived not superstar, super strong draft class. Right. And so with that mm. in mind, a guy like Otega needs to end up in the discussion. Now, I'm not claiming that I have him with a first round grade or second round grade or whatever. I, I, I'm actually kind of up in the air on him. And that's why I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation for us to have. Because in a normal draft class where you have your bona fide superstar blue chip prospects at the top of the draft, and then you have your kind of like, you know, guys that you can kind of project to be like strong players or whatever. Otega is an interesting case where um, obviously if you took things just at face value and you look at him se shooting 75% from the three point line, you go, <laughs> damn. Yeah. Right? right. But then you look a little deeper. He's only taken that 12 of them made nine of them. Right. Like there's not huge volume, right. Free throw shooting, whatever. But I, I think overall with Otega, my initial takeaway was like, Oh, I don't really like his game. It was my initial takeaway. And then I went a little deeper and then I was like, wait a minute maybe I'm looking at this incorrectly uh, and where I kind of landed Corey and I'm excited for us to kind of dig into is I, I think he's a guy that right now at this stage of the draft cycle is a guy that has a draftable grade on him. Um, I have some question marks about him on the offensive side of the ball specifically, but the reason why I ended up being kind of like happier with his game and like, you know, willing to put a draftable grade on him is because I really like what he does on defense. So mm. um, obviously we'll get into more detail later, but uh, as of now, I, I came away. I don't want to say I came away impressed, but I came away liking him as a player, uh, which is a pretty basic statement. <laughs> I, well, no, I think that that's interesting. Cause I know, you know, Maxwell is a little bit more skeptical about Otega and is taking a more patient stance. Um, I know Rucker and Steven, and I are probably the higher on the higher end of Otega as a prospect. Um, for me, I, I have him as like right now where I'm at. Uh, you know, I try not to do like a power rankings type big board, but right now I'm looking for guys who I think are NBA players. So I have Otega like as like a in the 20 ish range um, on my personal board because I think that he just is good. I think he's impactful and, you know, I want to see more of it uh, against, you know, a, a tough conference opponents, but like he has, you know, played some good teams and he's made an impact and performed well there as well. So, um, but you know, the first thing I always look at is just like frame athleticism movement. Like, does he just, does he move around the floor like an NBA player? And, that's something that I'm pretty confident that he does, that he does look like an NBA player. He does move like an NBA player. He plays at a cadence of an NBA player. There are things I would love for him to do better or at least more frequently. Um, but I see that he's the type of guy that I can envision playing as a supporting cast member um, in, in the way that like, you know, right now, like, it's a weird comparison, but like, I think he's kind of playing almost like Oklahoma city case in Wallace, mm. not Kentucky case in Wallace, but Oklahoma city case in Wallace, who's just okay. kind of like off the ball, like, you know, making smart cuts and spacing the floor, not quite as often and as willing as Kaysen is as a shooter. Uh, I, I really wish that he was again, but I, 
I just think that he's a guy who always makes an impact. And I think one of the things that, you know, you can say about Ortega is like, this is a dude who at the end of the day, like he is going to do the dirty work. He's going to do the little things and he's going to make winning plays. And, you know, I think that that starts getting into his film here. Like this is a guy who like, he will go create extra possessions and make winning plays like, you know, finding offensive rebounds and, and getting tip-ins like he does on this possession here. Uh, nothing crazy, but, you know, it's just like great timing yeah. on the tip in. And then an actual winning play in the game against USC coming in above one second left for the actual game winning, you know, tip um, to seal it. Like he is a guy who literally this year has made winning plays. So right. like um, as a role player, I think that that is really important looking for that stuff. Like he's not going to be above making the effort plays, you know, I, I think effort is one of his strengths and effort is a strength. Corey, I, I agree. I agree. I think where I landed and where I'm, where I'm at right now, once again, at this stage of the, of the cycle, um, I've been thinking about this class a lot. I've been thinking about how we evaluate players. And so, Corey, this is something that you talk about a ton. You talk about translatability. What does a guy do that works on the NBA level? What are things that he has in his bag, has in his arsenal that translates to the NBA level? I was talking to another, you know, big name uh, in the draft cycle. Won't name drop because I'm better than that. But, yeah, you know, whenever we talk about players, right, he always says, how many question marks does a guy have, right? Mm -hmm. When you're evaluating a guy, and, and he says he ends up higher on guys. So a, a player like, I don't know, um, like Anthony Black. You, we loved Anthony Black last draft class, and he was somebody that he liked as well. And he was like, what, what were his question marks, right? How many question marks did he have in his game? And it made me think like, okay, with someone like Otega, if we consider role, translatability, and then the question marks, Corey, I, I think I'm with you. I don't have him as high as you do, right? In that 20-ish range. But yeah. that also may be uh, a kind of thing where like, I need to also recalibrate how I'm viewing players at this stage, right? But ultimately, if you consider all those different factors, then I'm right there with you. And then I do believe Otega is a guy that works in on the NBA level, right? Maybe not as a superstar or a number one option or which is funny, right? Because a lot of times we look at these prospects and that's kind of the first place that our minds go to like, Ooh, like, is this guy going to average 20 points a game? Is he gonna, like, <laughs> I, I think if we look at him through the prism of NBA role player, my initial answer would be, I'm right there with you. And I agree because he makes impactful plays and is an impactful presence on the floor. And that's a very translatable skill set. And we talk about guys like all the time, that offensive rebound that you showed Corey as a Nick fan, I see Dante DiVincenzo make that all the time. And yeah. he signed a nice deal with the Knicks and he's a Josh Hart. Part, Josh Hart. Right. But, but you know, just specifically to Dante, like he's a starter now on this mm -hmm. Knicks team that's playing really well. And he makes exactly those types of plays and he plays that exact role where he spaces the floor he makes good cuts he plays good defense all night long that's an impactful guy that starts on a winning playoff contending basketball team so uh long monologue just to say Corey, i agree with you because i think the foundation of otega's game makes sense on the nba level yeah um going to the comments uh dirty dancer says that nice intersection of strength and athleticism if the shot's real he should be uh, a first round pick agreed um mr ray makes nba winning plays effort is a skill uh so i mean this is a guy who it's pretty clear to see from that aspect that like great athlete super length right and he's gonna make the effort plays where do you want to go next with his game uh could we talk about the shooting yeah yeah let's do it yeah, yeah. <laughs> wanted to pick your brain because um so Corey, for me where i'm at i think it's really interesting that you brought up the case in one right just because when we look back at case in college case was a guy who did a lot for that kentucky team right but he was able to flash on ball ability off ball ability his spot up shooting his passing playmaking stuff um but when i watched otega i had some concerns about his shooting i had a little bit of you know concerns about his uh impact on the offensive side of the ball but um I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear your perspective as well and maybe you know there's certain certain things that i'm missing so i uh, like to hear what you have to say yeah i 
don't really have concerns about the shot other than he needs to do it more. Okay. Um, I mean, look, I don't think that he's going to shoot 75% from the three point line (laughs) for the rest of the season volume, you know, be damned. Um, but like, I don't think there's anything functionally wrong with his form. Uh, I, I do think that part of the issue and the reason he's not shooting it all the time is that because his shot prep isn't always, you know, the best or that, you know, he, he's not ready to shoot. He doesn't have that mindset, but like, you know, right here, I mean, yeah, maybe knock knees a little bit, but yeah. like, that's never, that's not something that necessarily prohibits shooters from being good shooters. Um, you look at the release squared balance, you know, good follow through pointing at the rim. Like I, I think as far as what it looks like coming off of his hand, I think it looks pretty good. I think the on, you know, and he doesn't have many misses. So it's like, you know, you have to look for, you know, what's not there a lot of times, but you know, on, on this possession here um, against Providence, when we see his shot, it, it's going to feel like a little rushed, mm. you know, off the contest. Like mm. there, it's a, this one's a little clunky, even though he's like willingly shooting it, you know, still like a ton of time on the clock, you know, it's not like he's trying to get that off, but his, his process feels a little sped up there just because maybe there's a hand in his face. So like, that's something that I think as he, as he does increase the volume, he needs to, um, continue to improve and just be consistent with, but I think that comes with reps and that's why, you know, I, like I want that percentage to go down cause I want to see him shooting more shots, but you know, it, when he is shooting it, I don't know. He like, <clears throat> I think it looks good. I think he looks pretty confident doing it too. Um, you know, on this possession, like you're not going to come out I'm like, all right, that's fine. Uh, now this, you know, the college line is a little shorter and, you know, sometimes it feels like he's shooting for that exact distance, Mm. you know, like I think there will be an adjustment for moving back the, the couple of feet potentially, but like, I don't know, that looks pretty smooth. Like, you know, if we freeze it coming off his hand, like good, good lower body going to, he's get generating a good, good amount of power, freeze it right there. Like. Look at the follow through there, like smooth. Hmm. Okay. No, I, I mean, th- my biggest question was mechanically, um, just because I, you know, I'm not the shot doctor. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain about that. I, I thought for me at times it looked a little disjointed. Um, but then again, you know, from these examples, it looks pretty good. But um, I thought it t- at times, like the one that you showed before on the miss, it looked a little disconnected, not super smooth to me. And totally um, like that's there sometimes for sure. Yeah. 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 So, but then once again, like I, for me, it's all calibration, right? Like where, how am I viewing this player? What am I expecting him to be? be, What's his role look like in the NBA? And if you're, if you're just going to ask him to spot up, play good defense, make good cuts, you know, hit the offensive boards, then no, for sure. But it's just, I, I was just watching him shoot and watching his impact on the offense side of the ball overall. And I was just wondering if there was a ton of juice there, uh, was my biggest question, but, um, yeah, that, that's just kind of where I landed. Yeah, and I don't know if there's like a ton of juice, but I think that there is certainly a good amount. And like I, so this is as far as the shooting, like this is the concern, right? Like he has a ton of space here. Yeah. Right. And instead of shooting, he is going to go in and, you know, settle for like a contested layup. Okay. So for me, this is where his concern with the shot is, is that he's just unwilling. Now, I mean, he misses here, but this is, pretty fancy mm-hmm. layup forward. attempt, you know, good, good left extension, uh, same foot, same hand, like pretty crafty. So just with the shooting, it's like, I, he just needs reps. And, um, you know, like Mr. Ray says, needs to speed the shot up, raise the release a bit reps to smoothen it out. You, you got to attempt them, you know, you, yeah. you got to not be afraid to make those mistakes. And, um, you know, you don't want to play careless, but you also don't want to play too careful. But Shout out to the mighty, mighty Ducks three that I just watched. 
<laughs> but Corey, I will say this, right? And this is something that you've brought up in the past as well. When we when we did like the Amen Thompson breakdown, right? Yeah. That willingness has to be there because confidence is a big part of shooting. I don't remember. Was it Reggie Miller who said that? I don't remember. But confidence is a huge part of shooting. And so I hope with Owe that he continues, as you said, right? Continues to take more of them and he builds more of that confidence. Because if he's going to end the season with a really low amount of attempts, taken i think that'll be a little like, discouraging so i definitely agree with you that he just got to take more yeah totally like get the number of attempts up um but again like i he, there are times when he's not afraid to shoot it with a hand in his face right like you're 20 seconds on the clock mm. hand in his face like knocks it down like so you know there are moments that i find encouraging like if he was only shooting when he was wide 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 open you know maybe I'm a little less bullish on that shot panning out, but I just think that there are enough examples in that small sample of him being a willing shooter and shooting it confidently and it looking good coming off his hands for me that I'm willing to buy into it. I don't think that it's a guarantee that he shoots it. You know, obviously he can go on a little cold spell, miss like six shots in a row. And all of a sudden his percentages look significantly different. And we're like, Oh, I wonder if this dude could shoot, you know, he's at, he's 74% from the free throw line this year. He was 65% last year. So, you know, obviously the free throw shooting isn't anything that you're like, we have to buy into this, but you know, I, I'm willing to buy in. I, I think that he is going to find a way to make that work. Corey, I'm going to say I'm cautious. Um, I, I think sometimes I'm a little, and this is just me speaking for me, um, mm -hmm. which is dumb. You should always be speaking for yourself. Um, but I sometimes I feel like I'm a little too forgiving of things sometimes. Yeah. And so I want to be a little bit more cautious when it comes to Otega, just because that's what my gut was telling me. Now, my gut's been wrong before, uh, Johnny Davis, but uh, it's fine. <laughs> I, I, I want to continue. Yeah, it's like a Twilight Zone thing at this point. I, we need to there needs to be a documentary about that one soon someone's got a true crime yeah johnny <laughs> davis <laughs> let's get go get that netflix deal <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good God. yeah it's uh i'm i think that that's a totally reasonable take now one of the other reasons that i'm i'm pretty high on him is um i think that he's got some pretty awesome footwork and his yes. drives are filthy um, first step explosive dude he's explosive and he's smooth too like there are times when you watch him and you're like is he the football player at the pickup game mm -hmm. who's just like too strong or whatever and maybe a little bit reckless but then like dude like the spatial awareness to euro step through right there and then finish with the floater um and the floater's really good like really something that he's able to use like he has a little bit of three level stuff to him because he's able to to work in that in between a little bit i also kind of like the mid-range pull up when he attempts it i think that that's something he, he can get to but i think especially the floater is, is something that i thought was really um impressive and we see it you know off one foot there and then on on this possession i think you know we're going to see like the hop step um off too. So like, I like that he has multiple ways that he can get into these moves and, and finish. And I, I just think he's got good touch. So like, I'm just buying, I'm okay. buying what he's selling. Okay. I, I think Corey, there's a little bit of bully persona to him. And it reminded me as I was watching his tape, it reminded me of a discussion that you brought up in our group chat with Maxwell. Um, this was months ago where uh, you you guys were talking about when we evaluate draft prospects, one of the most underrated aspects of a basketball player's game is their strength. And uh, watching mm. Otega reminded me of that conversation that you brought up. And I was like, this is this guy's a bully. He's a guy who is extremely explosive. One of the things that I wrote down in my scouting notebook thing that I started for this year is that um, he is, it, that first step is really good with him. 
Um, he gets into the lane really quickly. And then as we've talked about before with other guys, like when we did the Davion one years back, he's got this thing where he's not just quick, but because he's so strong, it makes him quicker because mm. as he gets going downhill, his frame and strength creates even more separation. And then the thing that's really interesting with him is even in the clips that you're showing right now, Corey, is that he can be quick and strong and yet stop on a dime and put up, you know, these nice floaters, runners, or whatever. So that right there is an NBA skill. That is a very translatable skill that you're going to need. And if he's going to be a spot-up guy to start, right, in the NBA, um, after he makes a couple of threes, right, fingers crossed, if everything goes well and the shot, <laughs> you know, translates up, then, right. you know, people are going to close out hard on him, and then he's going to be able to flash some of that athleticism. And then, of course, obviously in the open, open court, you know, in trans and transition and stuff like that, he'll be able to do a lot of that stuff. So, uh, right there with you, Corey. I, I think the speed, power, explosiveness combination with him is an NBA level skill set for him. Yeah, uh, agreed. And you know, when I I talk about like Case and Wallace, you know, maybe you think, oh, setting a high bar here, but it's like also, I don't know, like. Uh, Javante Green, like guys like that who are, and, and he looks like he has better size than Javante Green, but like guys who are, have managed to carve out roles on NBA teams, barring health, um, through like that effort, energy, strength, athleticism combo. Uh, and, you know, he, Otega is a guy who has, where I think most people would say, you know, he has a limited bag. And, you know, I would uh, agree to that somewhat, even though, again, like I, I think I, he might have a little bit more with the ball in his hands than he, um shows because i think i see the flashes but like great cut great timing on the cut like great way to get yourself an an easy bucket defense collapses defender turns his back slides in easy to like winning players make plays like that um so uh he, he but he does it all the time and that's why his efficiency has been off the freaking charts now some of that is like some of the level of competition, but as you notice, like I'm really only showing, I'm mostly showing clips from the games against like the real <laughs> college teams. Right. So, you know, it, like he's also doing this against real competition and, you know, against USC on this clip, Kobe Johnson's going to turn his back and he's going to go and finish with his left. And that's something he's very comfortable with. Like he has no problem finishing with that off hand. And that's big time. I, I think when you're, um, looking at guys who are, you know, these kind of at rim finishers, like the more ways they can finish at the cup, obviously the more successful that they are going to be. And I, I think that Otega has, you know, that stuff. So, and, and the thing is like, we go back to the, being a football player, like he is really impressive off of these downhill DHOs where you can hit the whole, like a running back and, and, you know, have that little bit of extra burst um, and momentum already. And again, we see him going to that offhand, uh, finishes off the left foot, left hand, like really like impressive stuff from like, you know, one of your utility guys. Corey, I, I think before when I brought up the Dante comp, you brought up Josh Hart. And I think it, it's hard to not mention Josh Hart for a player like this, just because like when I watch Josh Hart take a three point shot, I never think it's going in because it always looks like he's <laughs> shooting it from the palm of his hand, but it goes in a good amount. And that's not his value, right? That's not really Josh Hart's job. His job is to be a really physical defender, to be a good offensive rebounder, to make smart cuts, to space the floor when he has to, uh, to terrorize in transition. And then you look at a guy like Otega Owe, who's averaging what, 15 points in college right now. And he's kind of asked to do similar things and he's doing them at a really high level. And like Josh Hart is using his athleticism, using his strength, um, using, you know, what he has, right. To make an impact on the game and a drive like this, like that's really nice, right. little like fake handoff all the way down yeah. to the bucket, strong finish through contact. Like this is the type of stuff that, you know, you get interested in because that's an NBA type of move and an NBA type of skill. So I'm with you, Corey. I, I think the more I talk it through with you, I'm kind of, relaxing relax wow can i say the word relaxing uh, a little <laughs> bit on my reservations with him as an offensive player allergies have hit me really hard today out of nowhere so i'm kind of not myself but uh no I i'm with you I, I i like what i've seen so far and maybe i've been a little too harsh on it, it but at this point in the process it's totally fair to yeah. be harsh and and with guys who you know aren't these like um 
I don't know, like blue chip level prospects. You don't know if it's just like a hot streak or not. Right. Cause he does have like flaws, you know, like I think when you look at like these wings, like not only do you want like that efficient offense from a scoring perspective, right. But you want guys who have like a connectivity, you know, if we use throw out a buzzword and that's something that I, I don't know where Otega is at. Right. Like I hear like, he's trying to make a play. He turns it over kind of telegraphing, you know, coming off and, and trying to hit the roll. Like not to say that he is, you know, super turnover prone, right. He's got about two a game, but, um, you know, he almost only has 11 assists. So he's got a negative assist to turnover ratio. And I think that's where you would see like the stark difference in like that case in Wallace example is that case has that point guard skill set. So he's going to make smart decisions um, as a passer and Otega, his job is to be a play finisher. So you, you're not relying on him to make a lot of those connective decisions, but he's also not at the point where he is making those decisions. I think if he also, you know, he had, he was putting up the 15 four uh, with the, the defense and everything. And then that 1.1 assist was three and a half. I think now he, there would really be something to get excited about. Right. But this is why, you know, this is a guy that you can be skeptical about because you got to be like, all right, well, what's the feel like, um, you know, in that kind of role. Mm-hmm. But uh, Corey, it's weird. I find myself shifting a little bit because I, I think you're asking a really important question. And yet my thing is like, damn, we mentioned Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart. How many assists are those guys getting per game? Right. Like, yeah. you know, they're not doing a ton of decision making with the ball in their hands. And yet, you know, as connective guys, you know, they can make the one they can make that one more pass. They can move mm-hmm. the ball. They can, you know, make plays for each other in transition. And yet, you know, you're not really going to give the ball to Josh Hart and be like, hey, create out of the pick and roll. Right. Which then speaks to Otega's, you know, value. Like, OK, maybe he's just not going to be a guy you can ever run pick and roll through. But if he's going to be a fourth guy, fifth guy on your floor who offers a ton on the defensive end and can shoot a little bit different, a little bit from outside, can go all the way to the rim, you know, pick up fouls, finish at the rim, there's still value in that. There's still a $40, $50 million contract for a guy like that in the NBA, right? So um, weird that I'm like defending him here kind of, but at the same time, I think, Corey, what you're bringing up kind of, I don't think it necessarily pigeonholes him, but from what we've seen so far and his inability to kind of create with the ball in his hands, it kind of is what it is in the modern NBA. Yeah, absolutely. I agree Um, 100%. So let's talk about some more of the fun stuff. Um, and that's his defense. It's it. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, his defense is what brought me back in, dude. I mean, look at this play. And talk about a winning play, right? <laughs> the the effort, the the closest to, to team, chase man. that down. Yeah. Corey, let, hold on. Let's let's pause it right here. Look at the what? wow, the gap that the the the, the yeah, exactly the amount of space he had to make up. Look at that, dude. Even though he, the guy's kind of fumbling with the ball, this is still pretty insane. Yeah. Good God. Like you still, as an offensive player, you're probably still like, oh, I'm about to oh, yeah. get a dunk, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, coming up. You know? Um, so, you know, again, winning plays in that defense, like he is one of these like defense to offense you know, event creators too. like, again, you bring it back to like the football player, like he just reads balls in the air so well. And then, you know, we'll turn that, that defense into offense. Um, I mean, you know, obviously like this balls in the air for a while, but like he reads it, he times it and then is able to, you know, get an easy two there, Um, you know, in, in, in a close game, not a meaningless game. So he's creating these easy buckets. Um, he does that constantly. You know, I, I think you're the football guy, so I'm sure there are plenty of football comparisons you probably have flying around your head, but he's just, again, he's like, he's got quick hands. He's strong. He's physically imposing. Like Mr. Ray says his wingspan for six, five is pretty wild. Like, yeah, I don't know what his true wingspan is yet until, you know, we get the official measurements at the combine, but like you could see, like he's got a, a pretty legit wingspan on him. He is not JJ Reddick alligator arms, right? No, for sure not. But Corey, just that play that you showed against USC, I mean, that that's just a past 
defended, pass deflected by a cornerback, right? He's going up, just absolutely smashing it, and then he's taking it for, for the nice two. I mean, the closing speed, the length, as Mr. Bray brought up, right? The anticipation with him. Look at that. Just reading the eyes of the ball, the the, the ball handler right there, knows where the pass is going. He should play football, man. Otega, <laughs> I, I bet he did. <laughs> six five cornerback, you know, like yeah, if six five DB like Kyle Hamilton on the Ravens right now, just he could do some damage here. Like the the speed and anyway, um, really really interesting player on the defensive side of the ball. Um, as we've mentioned, right, he's got good wingspan to him, good hands, right. Mm-hmm. He, and he's and the thing with him is he's not just physical and fast. He's also pesky. Was what I wrote uh, mm-hmm. in my in my notes with him is like he'll get into your shit and really really annoy you. Um, as a defender, he's not content with just like dominating you with his like physical gifts. He's also like, dude, I'm going to be on you and I'm going to make your life miserable. And those are the types of defenders that NBA guys like hate being defended by. Right. I think there's a sure. really, really dangerous <laughs> aspect of him on the defensive side of the ball where he's not just going to overwhelm you. He's going to annoy you, too. And that's a really goddamn good defender. So, Corey, as I mentioned before, I was kind of like kind of like out on not out on him but i was like really low on him and then i kept watching him on defense and i was like oh like this is gonna be a huge impactful skill for him in the nba and nba teams are gonna be really into him as a defender yeah because like he's six five so you're not like oh he doesn't have outrageous size who knows maybe he's like six four with shoes or whatever at the combine but like because he has that wingspan because he has that strength and because he plays with such physicality like he's gonna be a guy that you're like oh he he'll guard fours like in the NBA, like the NBA teams won't be afraid to like have him guard up. Right. Um, Khalif battle, tough shot maker, great ISO defense there. Um, low clock. Um, so good anticipation, not gonna, you know, foul a jump shooter or anything. Doesn't give him any room. Great timing on the contest. Uh, so, you know, I, I think he can, you know, play physically, but he can also just, play solid um and then you know i think he's like a a good like positional defender too i think that's partly why he is so good at creating you know those off ball steals um but you know it's it's also like he knows here like he he goes to dig and tag um just in case the the point guard hits the roller and then he's still able to use that athleticism uh, athleticism and close out and get a good contest in the corner so you know i i think that you have to be if you're a guy like him who is teetering like on that border and uh, of perception at this moment right like you got to get it done as a two-way player that has to be your calling card and i think he's one of these guys to me it's like efficient offense and crazy defense like he had seven steals in his last game right like and and that steal rate and block rate is consistent with last year so this is not a flash in the pan because they're yet to be in conference play like they're consistent with last year this is who he is as a defender so um i'm in i i love him i i could totally see him given a little bit more time with some of the the blue chip guys in this class if they don't continue to or if they don't turn it around necessarily mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that really there are any prospects that have cemented themselves in any kind of position. So like if this is a guy who continues to be a two way impact player, like I think by the time draft time rolls around, we start seeing some videos of him shooting the ball a little bit better. Right. He's working on his shot, probably some highlight reel dunks in, uh, you know, from the pro day and whatnot. And all of a sudden this is a guy who's really gaining some momentum, especially because Oklahoma is going to be a good team. And they're going to do some winning. And if you do some winning, you're going to, you know, be in a good position to have your name be in the ether and in the dialogue of the draft conversation. So I, I think the dude's legit. And uh, I, I kind of, you know, can't wait to see how the rest of his season kind of hums along. For sure. No, Corey, I'm with you. And really quickly, I, I know we're going to, change gears here but uh just wanted to say i think i think there were times that he w- was a bit of a risk taker uh in the passing lanes but i'm okay with that sure um you know he there, there's a willingness to him uh that i like but then also at the same time where you might say that he lacks discipline in that area some of the clips that you showed earlier and what i wrote in my notes is that like 
it's funny though, like on the ball, I thought he was really fighting himself to be disciplined and to not foul guys and to make the right play. So uh, I'm with you, Corey. I think he's going to be a really fun guy to watch. Um, obviously, he's going to be a name that we're going to have to continue to monitor because of some of the sw swing skills. But uh, at this point, I think he's an NBA guy. All right, let's take a quick break and then we will hit our next prospect. All right, we are back. And Albert, we're going to talk about a guy that I will actually be writing about later this week. Um, and that is Tyler Kolick from Marquette. Uh, and I think Kolick is going to be a little bit of a like contentious prospect. I think most people will probably agree that he is an NBA prospect, but I think where he goes in said draft, I think will be kind of up for debate. And I think, again, you will have, if you are the kind of uh, higher end of the spectrum with Kolick, I think you'll have your legit arguments. If you're on the lower end, you'll probably also have some legit arguments. So um, Tyler Kolick is a senior guard uh, from Marquette. Um, he is 6'3", 182. He's currently averaging 15 points, 5.9 assists, five rebounds, shooting 55% from the floor, 43.6% from three, 90.3% from the free throw line. That's an effective field goal percentage, 62.8. It's got a 25.1 PER, a box score plus minus of 12.6, um, steal percentage of three, assist percentage of 34.7. So um, I saw Kolik last year in person at the big east tournament um and he, he kind of caught my eye where i was like all right maybe i haven't been paying enough attention to colic because i think you know a lot of the focus was on um omax and then a little bit on oso but like when i watched live it was like oh colic is the guy who i think is really making like the engine go and be making an impact but like is he a good college player or is he an nba prospect and last year, I think he really, really made a leap into NBA prospect because he had a pretty rough first season um, at Marquette where he transferred. He was like super inefficient. Um, but last year, he, you know, upped that efficiency a lot and really drove like a lot of what Marquette did. Um and he had like a really sneaky under the radar productive season um, with like pro level uh, production. So like just to read you, um, going with a very basic like Bart query, um, true shooting percentage of 57, assist percentage of 35 or better, steal percentage of three and a box score plus minus of eight. These were the players who hit that threshold. Since 2008, Steph Curry, Ty Lawson, Evan Turner, Tyrese Halliburton, uh, Tyler Kolek, TJ McConnell, Drew Smith, Alex Renfro, and Nick Kalathis. So, like, NBA players, <laughs> like, definitely a spectrum of NBA players, but basically that whole list are pros. Yeah. So, <clears throat> like, and, and that's last year. I, I think he's arguably been better this year. Okay. Um Again, still early in the year, like not in non-conference yet. Uh, he, he certainly has, you know, his his warts and, and whatnot. But like, I think that he has a, a real shot to be an NBA player. And, you know, he looks like the most annoying kind of like frat boy lacrosse bro that you've ever seen. So like, it, it's a little awkward, but the dude is good hmm. at basketball. and. Uh, he maybe had a little bit of like an older archetypical point guard, which, you know, there's not a ton of, but like also he's not a shrimp. So while he's not like a jumbo creator, he's also not, you know, like he might be hovering that border of like where he can kind of make it on his size and, you know, his physical attributes. So wh where are you at with Kolik? 
I, th there's so many things that you said that I wanted to jump in and laugh about. Um, but the first thing is, if you have a 6'3 lacrosse bro, bro approaching you at a frat party, just, you know, avoid him. Um, those guys... <laughs> Those guys are strong. And if probably gonna give you a wedgie. <laughs> yeah, dude. If he's six three, just walk away. Avoid <laughs> that. You know, you don't want that smoke. Okay. Six <laughs> three lacrosse, bro. Um <laughs> is the first thing I wanted to say. But um, no, Corey, I, I think it's hilarious that you mentioned like TJ McConnell, Nicolathis. Um, I, I thought of guys like Peyton Pritchard. You know, mm -hmm. what do they have in common? Right. But also like even a guy like Deuce McBride, you know, like mm -hmm. the, there are these there are these guards in the NBA that look, NBA teams need to fill roster spots and teams need a third, fourth guard. Um, the San Antonio Spurs need a point guard like there there is there are availabilities in the NBA where a guy like I think Tyler Kolick could find himself getting employed by an NBA team. Corey, I, I just want to read this off because after his first year, George Mason, he went to Marquette and in his freshman season, he took four three pointers per game and he had twenty eight point one percent of them. That's mm -hmm. not good. Not um, great. But ready last year. In his uh, junior season, second season with Marquette, he took a little bit less. He took 3.3 .3 per game, but he shot it at 39.8%. This season, he's taken 3.5 per game and hitting 43.6% and shooting 90% from the free throw line. Obviously, not on huge volume, but the shooting has clearly improved. Now, when I watch him shoot it from outside... He kind of looks like a lacrosse pro. It looks kind of <laughs> weird, right? It kind of looks like he has a stick in his hand and he's kind of catapulting. I don't know. But it is it it is a little weird to watch sometimes. And obviously, Corey, you can tell us way more about that. But the biggest thing for me, Corey, and I think it's still freaking hilarious that you brought up the whole lacrosse thing, is because he's tough. Like when you watch yeah. Cole play, there's a toughness that he plays with that's really interesting. One of the first things that I wrote in my notes after watching his games, number one, he has his best games against the stiffest competition, right? Whether it was Texas or Illinois or whoever, those when he plays against those teams, he has his best games. And the second thing is for a 6'3 guard, this guy can freaking screen the hell out of people. Like he sets some solid ass screens and you're like, this is really, really nice. And it's not something that you're really looking for from your 6'3 point guard, but he does things on the floor that are impactful and weird for a guy his size but it's because he's tough as hell um he's a real like you know classic gamer right or like the old baseball scouts like uh you know this guy you know ugly girlfriend you know blah 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 he he's he's a guy that scouts will love or old time scouts would love because he's gritty he's a gamer he plays hard he makes winning plays and he gets up for the big games right classically Derek Jeter has been overrated. I'm a Yankee fan. I've loved him my whole life, but I know the truth. Derek Jeter was overrated as a baseball player, but why do we have such a nostalgic high view of who Derek Jeter was as a baseball player it was because he shined the brightest on the biggest Big stages. Moments. And and I think Tyler Kolick might be that type of player where I'm not saying he's a superstar, but with what he's been given from a physical aspect and with his skill set and with how hard he works, he shines the brightest on the biggest stages. And I think that means something. Yeah, I agree with you hundred percent. Like he is not afraid. Um, he is the one who knocks, you know, like uh, my, the article of my colic title or the article title of my colic article um, is Tyler Colic is a motherfucker. Great. Look at that. Perfect. <laughs> because that's what he is. And like, you know, if you've been around basketball, like, you know, you're talking to a, a scout. If they say, oh, the kid's a motherfucker. It's a good thing. Good thing. You know? It means he's got a little bit of shit to him, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, now you can be too much of one, and that would be like Draymond Green right now, who is suspended indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But if you can hone in your motherfuckerness to appropriate levels, then it is a major asset because you know you're you're just always going to play with that chip on your shoulder, that edge that is going to allow you to always think that like you belong, and you can you know not only that you belong, but like you are going to win whatever situation that you're in. And that's, you know, kind of what he brings. So, um, you know, I, I think that you, you touched on, you know, the shooting improvement 
Um, you know, it's kind of weird. Like that first season at George Mason, his volume was crazy. Um, like, and Almost it's seven, like, yeah. and, and it, it's, it went down consistently. Then it's back up a little bit this year. Like his volume isn't where you want it to be necessarily. Um, you, you want it to be, maybe he's at like eight threes per hundred. I think he's at like 6.6. Yeah. Um, but he's not like a non shooting threat, obviously. And like, obviously he's a good shooter with good touch, 90% from the line on like five attempts a game. So that's real, um, back to back 40 plus percent shooting seasons with where he's at right now. I mean, he's 50, 40, 90 right now. So like that being in that club, like you're a good shooter, but really this is what he needs to do. And he just needs to punish when teams go under on shots. You know, he because he is such a downhill player and he's a lefty. So, you know, he has that funky lefty game to him. But as long as he can do this where he is burying unders, then he will be fine because it's going to allow him to at least get downhill in most situations. You know, and we'll talk about how why I think he's kind of an underrated athlete. Um, because he's not a traditional athlete, like mm. an athlete, certainly, but I think he's underrated <clears throat> because of how he uses it. But this is what he needs to do and just prove that he can punish unders and then show that like he has NBA length, uh, NBA range, you know, right here, little logo shot. Let's go. Clocks winding down against Texas. Um, buries it. High arc and ball splash. Mm-hmm. But this is what is going to allow him to get downhill. And when he's downhill, he's so tough because he has been an excellent finisher this year. Um, And he's an excellent playmaker. So the combination of his ability to finish at the rim and then also collapse the defense, make plays for his teammates, this is what opens it all up for him. Corey, he's... I, I love... I like the way that you put it, and that's why you are a wordsmith, right? That when you're talking about him getting downhill, he's he is that type of player, man. He's, I mean, the way that synergy is grading him out as a finisher at the rim. All I'm seeing is excellent, very good, excellent, right? This is a guy <laughs> that, you know, synergy they like him as a as a finisher at the rim, and he's freaking good. And like the thing that I like about him is he's good at you know the what is that called the what tree knocker no (laughs) (laughs) it's definitely not tree knocker um he's good at you know attacking the bigs by putting out big floaters (laughs) (laughs) finishing amongst the trees (laughs) no what is it called oh it's there's a saying for it right when they're good against big guys anyway um colix that guy and once again Corey, at he's not the traditional athlete right he's not super quick He's not going to jump really high. I think his vertical, if they tested at the combine, he might have the lowest one. Who knows, right? Yeah. But the thing with Kolek that I like is he has such a pace to him, man, that he mm-hmm. plays with. He's never sped up. You put him in the pick and roll, he's going to put you in jail a ton. That hostage dribble is great. He's a really good lob thrower, which I think is all connected, right? I think he's a good lob thrower, good floater guy good push shot guy good touch around the rim i think all of those are kind of connected like he's just he's got really nice touch as a passer and shooter and you see it man once he starts getting downhill finish with both hands he can you know a little head fake he'll put your shoulder into you he had some nice finishes on guys like dylan mitchell like bigger dudes athletic dudes he's like I, i'm not worried about you i'm gonna go straight into you and you're not gonna do <laughs> shit because i'm tough as nails i'm not afraid of you i have you know, and he's got the savvy once again, right? The pace, the savvy, the wherewithal, all that stuff. So I'm right there with you, man. I think Kolik is a really interesting downhill guy, but the real thing is like the more he like utilizes that outside shooting as a weapon for him, the more dangerous he's going to be getting downhill. And already he's such a threat because of his playmaking and passing. This is a guy that loves himself a jump pass into the weak side corner. He loves yeah. himself a nice little wrap around to the big man at the dunker spot. So uh, I'm with you, man. Really, really savvy player. Yeah. And you know, with his finishing, um, in the half court, he's 62.8%, right? And you're like, all right, well, he is a guy who, like you said, he's pretty groundbound. 
he doesn't have like typical blow by burst, but you said he plays with great pace, right? And that's what he does. But he's also like he's physical, and that's that motherfuckerness. Like he he gets into the body, bumps Dylan Mitchell, who's having an underrated season this year, yes. um, yes. bumps him off his spot to create that that little extra amount of space for him to use that extension and finish. Like he's not afraid to get into um, the body of guys and finish through contact. And he's also not afraid to attack those bigger athletes. Um, you know, we saw, uh, Dylan Mitchell, who was a, a much bigger, more athletic player than him here. He's going to attack KJ Adams, who, you know, is a very good switch defender. He has no problem. Again, he's getting downhill to his left, but if there's one thing we know, you just can't get a, keep a lefty from getting downhill to his left. Like these guys just get to their spots. Right. And you know, this is not like a, a one-off over, um, KJ either, you know, this is, he was able to, uh, finish over KJ on multiple possessions and KJ's big. He's strong. Um, right now got him on an Island. Let me take him. And then he also has that touch mm -hmm. really good with the extension. And then he has the touch. Um, so you look at that and you're like, all right, a couple of good athletes. How about we have him finishing over the biggest player in college basketball a couple mm -hmm. of times? Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. Here we go. Zach Eady. Come here, little boy. Look at that. That is yeah. beautiful. Soft mm -hmm. touch, man. And it's just great touch. Um, over Zach Eady. Phased. No, not phased at all. Um, and we know that because that was not the last time he went and attacked Eady, right? Here, into his body with the finish. Going right into the seven foot four behemoth center, um, who was just like statistically one of the most impactful college players ever. <laughs> You know, and and is just a real presence around that rim at the college level. And Kolek's not afraid to go into his body and just you know finish through it. it it's going to be the name of the game for him, like just tough, fearless. Look at TJ McConnell, man. The career that he's had in the NBA, very similar. Um, obviously, I'm not saying it's a one for one. Don't please don't quote me saying that. But um, no, I mean you need these guys, man. You need guards coming off the bench or maybe even starting for you, right, that are unafraid, that can shoot from outside, that can create off the dribble, that, you know, can can be gamers for you. Mm -hmm. Why did I drag that A so long? I don't know. But you need guys like Tyler Kolick in the NBA. And so whether it's Kolick or Owe, I think it's really interesting that you paired these guys together today for us to talk about, Corey, because I think both of them are maybe not your conventional Ooh, but a first round grade on that guy type of guys. But I think both guys will get called. Uh, their names will be called on draft night. And it's because they offer value with clear skill sets that translate to the NBA level. Yeah, 100%. Um, and one one last thing I want to point out on, on this particular clip that Kolek does a lot that I love. And it's going to happen right here as he comes off the screen. He uses this like push ahead dribble. And this mm. is part of what makes him like such a functional athlete. One, he attacks like with really good pace when he comes off the HOs and he comes off screens, like he is willing to like have a little bit of momentum behind him while he's attacking, but just that little push ahead and add the screen in. And now like his defender is completely on his heels. Right. And he does that all the time, whether it's to make plays for his teammates or for him to get downhill, but he's just so good at utilizing that extra little crafty, um, you know, uh, heady play that, that will give him, and an advantage. Um, now in the comments, Mr. Ray says, is Kolek this year's Brandon uh, Pajemski, the guy who people publications won't catch on to until a month before the draft. You know, I think that there's similarities with pods in the ways in which that Kolek scores, you know, pods is measured out. What I assume is going to be a little bit bigger than Kolek. And I think that matters a little bit. And I think that pods is also a more willing shooter but I, I do think that there are some similarities yeah yeah definitely think that's fair um and pods was like an advanced stats you know monster and now he's been you know one of the warriors yep. <laughs> players this year, so. <laughs> tough season <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I mean look shout out to, to air pods that dude rocks oh. but yeah probably a little uh <laughs> 
<laughs> off season if that's the case. Uh, uh, Corey, if I can really quickly, going back to your point about him, like with that little, you know, hit away dribble or whatever. Like it's a game of inches, right? We've heard that forever. And for a guy like Holick who doesn't have conven- conventional elite athleticism, him creating advantages here and there goes a long way. And so I'm right. I, I I couldn't agree with you more, man. There's a headiness, a savviness to his game that you know creates advantageous you know situations for him. And I think it's a fun player. Like you need guys like that on the team. So, a hundred percent. Playing a, a little clip that'll give you a little uh, <laughs> bit of a look into give us a spoiler into my my uh, article, which is I have a little film breakdown comparing Kolik and Goran Dragic, Miami yeah. Heat era, yeah. a little bit. Um, I think that there are a lot of similarities in in the style in which they play and Marquette playing, you know basically an NBA offense and Kolik having Oso Iguodaro as a, this, you know, kind of DHO hub, Dragic having Bam as the screener DHO hub. Uh, I think the way that they push their pace, the way that when they get up the floor, even if it's not transition, they're jogging the ball up the floor. They're, they're making the defense play up to their speed. They're dictating the tempo. So I think there's a lot of ways in which they're similar. And like, I think you probably think of Drogic as like a better shooter than he was throughout his career. Like if you go and look at his numbers, like he wasn't as good a shooter as I would have thought. Um, now I think that Drogic, he's a little longer. I think he's probably a little bigger maybe, mm-hmm. but I think that they play a similar style. Um, you know, right here, nice little pocket pass to Oso Iguodaro when he rejects the screen. And, you know, we have a, you know, similar pass uh, with Drogic into uh, Bam for a pocket pass too. Like these are guys who, who know how to get to those elbows and then make a decision uh, and playing with smart bigs who can then read, you know, where the rotations are coming from. So, you know, just a little teaser into one of the directions that you know my piece goes into but uh i think that kolik is a guy that who could have that kind of career where he's bouncing between bench player and starter depending you know on the team and the situation i'm still recovering from seeing kevin knox in a knicks jersey but uh But uh, uh, no, Corey, I I think that's a really interesting comp. I can't wait for your piece to come out because I I love when you do those comp um, articles where it's like your whole article, not your whole article, but like a big chunk of it. Those are always interesting and makes a lot of sense for what we're trying to do. So um, I can't wait to to read it. But, um, you know, Dragic was a guy that, you know, was a huge contributor to a team that made the NBA finals. Like, that's awesome. That's a really valuable NBA player. Played on a lot of winning teams. Played on a lot of big time moments. Yeah, yeah. That's a motherfucker to him. Yeah, yeah. Great comp, dude. I I can't wait to read it. Yeah, but you know, anyway, just sticking with Kolek. Like this dude is a great passer. You know, when he gets downhill, he is a walking paint touch. And when he does, like he will make the reads that he needs to make. You know, we see him on this clip doing a great job um, using that empty ball screen. Beats the switch kicks it out to shooter in the corner. Marquette's loaded with shooters. Um, so again, like it's a great context to watch a guy like this when projecting him to the NBA because this is how he would kind of play. Uses that little jump pass, right? The, has the the advantage of, of being a lefty again. Like just uses all of that stuff to his advantage. And one of the things that I think he does really, really well um, in in playing with those different speeds he is such a good decelerator. So mm-hmm. even when he gets, you know, sped up, he's able to kind of use those last steps to slow down just a little bit. He collapses the defense entirely here, right? Bona comes and helps. And then he's able to just make that laser pass uh, again to one of his shooters in the corner. And he's able to do that with finishes. He's able to do it with, you know, Passes, uh, that deceleration, I think, is such an important skill um, for guys like him to use, and, and he's got that in his bag. Yeah, 
no man he, he's got some Brem, brembo breaks to him uh and this clip reminds me that i've dropped a dembo and a ton on my board too i just i'm fine yeah you know, Bismack Biombo ish, but um, I, I I I'm with you, dude. There's a slow down thing to him that I really love, and um, just once again, Corey, this is all like pace and savvy and all that stuff that's so freaking fun. And like, this is weird. No, this isn't weird. This is just junky sicko type of stuff that you have to really love basketball to get into. In my opinion, Corey, I really think you have to love basketball, like really love basketball, to get into a type this type of guy like really watching the nuance and the beauty to his game that it doesn't come out, you know, on a traditional stat sheet all the time, but um, mm -hmm. I'm with you, man. He, he's, he's awesome. Yeah, he is. Um, you know, he's a lot of fun. Like, I, you know, he plays with a little bit of flair too. Um, you know, we'll see right here. I think this is a, an awesome yes. pass. And it's bobbled by Chase Ross. You know, um, somebody who, again, I I think is uh, going to be an NBA player himself. But I I love this the, the little push ahead, and then mm -hmm. mm. that's that's that Chris Paul reverse spin dribble. <laughs> yeah, that's just so sick, dude. It's let's watch it again. Oh, <laughs> where are you going? Yep, just right under the defender's nose. Catch like, the you ball, can't bobble. Dog. Come on, dog. Come on, Chase. Catch You're better than that. Ball. Yeah. What the hell was that? Yeah, but he's got that flair. Like he can make the improvisational reads. He can make you know all of like you know the pick and roll reads. Um, you know, like you said, he's great at at throwing the lob. He's great at you know snaking screens right and like doing the the slow it down, get you in jail, all that stuff. Like, he's got it all in his bag as a playmaker. Um, right here, right? Whoop! It's awesome. And you know, three free throws at the the rim doesn't get the assist, but like comes off that NBA double stagger. Stagger, yep. Slides into open space. He's just a good basketball player, like straight up. Like he's just good. They were calling that seventy seven, right, at the hoop summit. The double uh, stagger, right? yeah. I believe so, oh. but no, great, really great. He's so good at putting them in jail, and like as we started off with, like just the strength to him. Like he's gonna pound dribble you to death and use his strength to keep you on his back. Just great stuff. Really great yeah. stuff. Now, you know, like I I defensively, um <laughs> oh. here's the thing, like I don't think he's a bad defender necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like one on one, whatever. Like I, you know, we'll yes. show a nice clip of him guarding um Karen Shannon here. Stays with his man, right? Like he's not like the slightest of foot, the fleetest of foot. No, you know, yeah, like he's not. He, you know, he's he doesn't have again. He doesn't have like traditional athleticism. Um, so on the ball, I think teams will try to target him. They'll try to get him in switches. They'll challenge him in that way. They'll you know quicker guards will try to see how well he moves laterally. Um, but at the same time, like I do think he competes. I think he's a little bit stronger than you think that he is. So while he doesn't have like a long wingspan to contest, you know, KD gets him on the block, like, you know, just run back on, you know, yeah. the other way. Right? Um, Easy pass. But, yeah. yeah. But like, this is the guy who has had back to back years now with 3% steal percentages. He is like always in the right spot. Um, so like, he just has good timing on when to like gamble and, and take advantage of guys who are just like not paying attention. Um, you know, just coming in, sneaking yeah. in like that. Right. And then we're off to the races. Like he does, you know, little stuff like that, doubling down on the post. Um, when, when the post guy isn't paying attention, uh, you know, we'll see something similar, um, on Hawkins in that Illinois game, you know, he's going to get the game, the ball, um, not necessarily on the post, but, uh, more at the elbow area and has no idea what's happening behind him. And Kolek just comes up behind him and, you know, gets himself an easy basket. So like, right. I think that he has quick hands. I think that he's the fact that he's always in the right spots defensively allows him to generate a lot of steals, um, and then start fast breaks. So like, 
I think he is going to be adequate enough defensively, especially if he has good defenders with him. I don't think he is Alex Caruso. I don't think he's a guy that is going to make your defense better just with his mere presence. But I also don't think he's a guy that is going to kill you on that end because I think he's smart and he can compete. But ultimately, that is the swing skill. And And that's the thing, you know, that and the shooting are the two things that I would really worry about um, if I was going, why wouldn't he make it? Like if I was asking myself, why wouldn't he make it? It would be like, doesn't shoot threes enough at volume to make defenses really scared. Um, and you know, defensively, he just didn't have the athletic tools to be able to handle, you know, moments in playoff situations where teams are going to target him almost in the same way that like Peyton Pritchard has struggled to stay on the floor. Right. Like, um, that I just don't think that he can handle the load defensively and and teams pick on him. And a team like the Celtics has other options that they can go to where they're not going to give up anything on that end. And everything will be a little bit harder just based on the options that they have. So, but not every team has that. So, you know, I, I think that ultimately like it's going to be based on his situation. Like it is with a lot of players. Like if he goes to a good defensive situation, he will, be a fine defender. If he goes into a train wreck of a team that has no direction, he won't really make much of a difference until he finds himself in a better situation. But like good anticipation, good positional defender, adequate enough size, not going to be a guy you switch a ton on, but like he'll fight if need be. He'll be fine. Yeah, Corey, I think, uh, you know, we're, you got to kind of throw the same cliches out there when you have a guy who isn't like an elite defender but competes hard right you you call him scrappy <laughs> is what you call him and that's what Tyler Golick is he's a scrappy defender but I I, I agree and but also Corey this is, where, this is where my head is at right now let's say you know we say that his swing skill is the defense and the shooting right in terms of volume I, I still think he's he's a good enough shooter where uh, you know he just has to up the volume so that's not a huge question mark for me obviously on defense he's not the strongest on ball defender but great positionally right really knows no how to you know come and double and help out and do the right things so like even with those question marks i think he's at least a second round pick like i think most nba teams will even with those question marks in mind they would have no problem spending a top 60 pick on a player like this because of what he can do as an outside shooter, even if it is on low volume, what he can do as a guy going downhill and being a creator, I think that is valuable enough to spend a top 60 pick on. So um, I I think he's going to be good. I I, I'm not claiming he's going to be a star, but this is that draft, right? We're looking for guys that are going to be good, that are going to contribute to an NBA team and can make a 15 man roster is kind of where we're at. Yeah, I I think in this draft, currently where I'm at, he's a first rounder for me. Okay. You know, and and that's considering teams with at the end of the draft who maybe are a little bit more willing to take just a player that they think can compete now versus taking a project who they're not really going to get any value on on their rookie deal when maybe their salary cap is jumping up. I think he could, I think he plays an NBA style, so it's not going to be hard to see what that looks like at the NBA level. Um, it's just going to be about him, you know, finding that rhythm and and getting caught up to the speed of the game as it is with any rookie. But like, I think he has that such a high feel. He's such a high processor. I don't know how long that process will be, and I think he's going to contribute on his rookie deal, uh, yeah. or at least I think there's a good shot at that. So I think it, you know, a team like. He is going to be one of those guys who the teams that have the strong culture who draft like the good players, like they're going to be like, okay, this is a guy you can add to this core and he's going to fit right in. You know, it, the, if the Miami Heat picked him in the 20s, like I would not be shocked. I think he is like a Miami Heat culture guy, right? Like I could also see him playing on the Nuggets. Yeah. You know, in a backup point guard role. Um, you know, I even read an article uh, about. Um, Oso Iguodaro uh, today in which, you know, Shaka Smart had been asking um, Nuggets assistant um, Adelman, Coach Adelman, Mm -hmm. like for tips on, you know, how to run, you know, some offensive stuff. And, you know, they were running some Nugget type stuff, you know, based on what he said. So, like, I could see that being a potential fit down the line. So, I you know, I I just think he's he's a basketball player. He's not going to be your star. He's not going to be your second option. Probably not going to be your third option. But like, if he's a guy 
that could be your fifth starter eventually, or could be the guy who comes off of your bench and runs the second unit and you can trust him. He's not going to turn the ball over a ton and he's going to keep the offense humming and you don't necessarily lose a ton. Then I think that's valuable too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a team like the Spurs could look at him too and be like, Hey, yeah, they, they need it. They need they, a, a guy like that, you know? And I think firstly, they need a veteran guy like that, but like, with Kolek, you're getting an older guy who can maybe Senior. step in a little bit sooner. And, you know, maybe if you have Kolek, you have Kolek and and Jones, and maybe now you're just playing two point guards instead of fidgeting with and experimenting with whatever you're experimenting with. But yeah, I think Tyler Kolek's fun, man. And, you know, I think Otega always fun. And I think these are two guys who could possibly find themselves in the first round. I wouldn't be shocked if they went late in the second. I wouldn't be shocked if they weren't drafted. You know, like in this draft, I'm not going to be shocked by anything, but um, there are two prospects that I think are good at basketball. And I think in this draft, if you can get somebody who's good at basketball, I think that might be a win. A hundred percent, Corey. And I think this is going to be an interesting, I I'm glad we recorded this because come draft time, I think people may come back to this episode that we recorded because these might be, these might be guys that ended up getting taken and teams are going to be really interested in the type of players that they're getting. And I think both guys are NBA guys. And I think we're going to look back on this episode feeling pretty good about our evaluations about both guys. Yeah, no doubt. I can't wait to watch Kolek um, in person again this year. Um, just see, you know, what kind of leaps he's made um, compared to last year up close. So, you know, definitely be on the lookout for that. Albert, uh, tell the people where they can find you on the World Wide Web. Uh, you can find me at Alberto Gim on Twitter. You can find me at GTG NBA uh, on Instagram. Uh, I haven't been writing recently. Uh, I've had some stuff going on in my personal life, but I'm working on my next piece. I uh, have an idea in mind. Just need to get that going again. Get, you know, get the fingers working again. Um, but uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. All right. You can find me at Corey Tulliba on Twitter. Uh, you can follow us at no ceilings, NBA.com at no ceilings, NBA on socials. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube live, make sure you like subscribe, uh, share all that good stuff. Uh, make sure that you rate review, subscribe, share comment, all that stuff on our podcast feed. We're available anywhere you can find us. And until next time we are out. Peace.